Right, thank you so much for staying with us, Faze Nation. And uh, two of my colleagues are here with me. Amos Dunia is the executive editor of Forefront Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us, Amos. And uh, also joining us is Philip Yam, who is a political correspondent of the New Telegraph newspaper. Philip, thank you for joining thank you, us. Man. Our guest is Omoyele Showare, who is the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress, AAC. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for bringing me. Well, we must apologize uh, very sincerely for bringing the program to you a few minutes behind schedule. But yeah, Shaware is here with us now, and it's time to find out why he is running for the presidency of Nigeria. Thank you for bringing me once again, uh, and uh, good evening to Nigerians. I am running to become the president of Nigeria in 2019 because for 58 years <laughs> since independence, this country has been governed by uh, leaders who do not understand the country Nigeria, who do not understand its people, and apparently uh, has not had interest of the people at heart. And I have uh, been through seven presidents in my lifetime since 1989 when I entered the University of Lagos and have seen how the last president was better than the next one up until today because the standards for running a government has been completely absent. And where we are today is that Nigeria has been left broken, broke, uh, with huge unemployment numbers, with children out of school, becoming a country where you're likely to die before you reach the age of five, and recently became uh, the country uh, which is the poverty capital of the world, whereas other West African countries or other sub-Sahara African countries are doing better than us, we are getting worse. But we stand here deceiving ourselves that these things will change if we don't change the players who are gaming us uh, in this country. And people like me who have always stood on the side thinking that we can help them shake the trees when the fruits are ripe uh, would have a different country if we don't step into the ring. I uh, suddenly realized that we are deceiving ourselves. I'm 47 <laughs> years old. The people who fought for independence in Nigeria started doing it in their 20s. Uh, the Azikwes, the Awolowas, uh, and uh, the Amadu Belos, uh, the Tafawa Balewas, made con this country even a better country in their 20s. As a matter of fact, President Buhari was 34 years old uh, when he was the Minister of Petroleum Resources. There were refineries then. He came back 40 years later. He can't fix the refineries. President, I mean, the former vice president, who is the PDP presidential candidate, Atiku, ran for presidency in 1992 when I was in the university. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria today has been around since the days of Lugard. Uh, I'm talking about Aldo Ogbe. I'm, I'm just exaggerating there. These guys have no ideas. I'm not quarreling against their age. I'm quarreling against the age of their ideas. And the fact that they have no capability, if you leave this country in their hands, in their care for the next 40 years, they have <laughs> nothing else to offer. So it is for those of us who want to see a different country, who want to change this country, and I'm not talking about the fraudulent change they brought four years ago, real revolutionary change to step into the ring, fix this country by putting in power or in position of authority by election people who know how to do things right. And I have done things right for 30 years, and my records are there for people to question, to query, to interrogate, and understand that you're talking to a person of integrity who can take this country to prosperity and progress starting from next year. Talking about your records, yes. many will ask, what are those records that you're talking about? Many will say, you do not have any experience in government and governance. You, do, you have not held any public office before. Where are you going to tap that experience that you need to run a country as large and as diverse as Nigeria. It's very interesting that uh, people swear on that. Then it would have meant that people who had the experience you're talking about would have done this country differently. President Buhari, for example, was the president of this country before. President Olusha Gumbasanjo was the president of this country before. If you want to count your experience as the experience we need, they should have been the most experienced leaders, but look at where they left this country. The people that I've mentioned in the past who fought for independence, ask yourself, where did they get political experience? Which public office did Awolowo hold before he fought for independence? Which 
public office did they hold before they became regional leaders that all of us are jealous of today? When Gowon became the president of this country and fought through a war, which political office did he hold before he became the president at the age of 29 or thereabout? None. We are talking about character. Countries that are looking for leaders that will take them to progress are not looking for people who have experience in stealing or assassination or deception. They are looking for people with character. Countries vote for presidents with character. They don't vote for presidents with useless political experiences. I do not need to have been in public office. But here is what I want to tell you about my experience. Every time it was necessary to find somebody to fight for the progress of this country when we needed democracy, as a student activist, I was there, laid my life, you know, on the ground for whatever could happen. And in 1999, that democracy came about. When there was a time in this country that everybody said if Obasanjo didn't become the president the third time, this country would not make progress. I was one of the few people who stood up and said, third time is unacceptable because we can't afford the Mugabe in this country. When President Yara Dua was sick and was dying and there was a cabal around him that prevented a minority from becoming president, and all of the political leaders, including judges in this country, including parliamentarians, the Senate, the House of Representatives, even a young person at that time who was speaker, Bankoli, sided against Jonathan becoming president. I used Sahara Reporter to expose the fact that Jonathan was brain dead and Nigeria needed to prepare for it. Not even the Niger Delta militants could do it, even though they said he was their man at that time. We are talking about character here. We are talking about courage that could take countries to bigger levels. And I'll give you two more examples of countries that had people of my pedigree. I'm not as big as they are. Mandela came directly from prison. Which local government did he govern before he became the president of South Africa? The most stabilizing force in the history of that country. Obama was regarded as a community organizer. Somebody might say he was a senator, but it was just for six months. But he was known as a community organizer and derided for it. He stabilized America's economy for eight years that he was in America. He's described as America's best president because it wasn't because he was a former senator, but because he was a man of character, intellect, capacity. And that is the mistake we must not make. You cannot continue to have people who do not have ideas, people who have no character, people who have no capability, boast about experiences that have failed us, and we are shouting experience. I don't understand what experience you need more than that of a 30-year-old experience that I have. I have, I'm 47 years old, Nigeria is 58 years. Out of 58 years, I've dedicated 30 of my years on earth fighting for what is just and right. In it. There's no political event in the last 30 years that took place that I wasn't part of. Which experience do you need more? Okay. Gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Shore, you are most welcome once again. Thank you so much, sir. You alluded to the U.S. where you have both structures and institutions working. Yes. Here in Nigeria, such do not take place. Do you think you'll be able to use the same parameters that the leaders in U.S. South Africa you alluded to? When Mandela can, became um, the Let me finish, yes. if you give me a chance. No problem. Do you think you can use the same parameters? that are used in these nations in Nigeria that is so complex and has refused to grow beyond what you think. Manoza, you said during your opening that each leader we have is worse than the, the last person. Yes. If you have to tell me in details, what indices did you use to arrive at your conclusion? <laughs> well, I'll start with your last uh, position. I read a newspaper today that President Goodluck Jonathan is calling Buhari incompetent. You know, we used to call him incompetent. In fact, the economists describe him as a buffoon at a point. This is the economist newspaper. But he is so comfortable today that he could call his successor incompetent. That's just to tell you because this one is contemporary. You know, but let me go back to the issues you raised. You see, institutions and structures are not built on their own. They are built by men of character. When you are talking about the U.S., what is keeping the U.S. going is not just those institutions. 
is the character of men that are occupying the institutions, or those ones who have historically built the institutions. If you look at the U.S. today, if the U.S. were to be Nigeria, Mullah would have been sacked. I mean, the special prosecutor, I mean, the, the special counsel who is looking into the Russian Russia. meddling with the yeah. election. It's not as if President Donald Trump can't sack him. But the country's conscience, which is behind this institution, its history and pedigree, will not allow that to happen. Men who are working with him, who have to advise him, who know that there will be consequences if they even give such an advice, will not allow him to do that because they know that there are chains of commands that will suffer for it if that were to happen. But you talk about South Africa. When Mandela came, South Africa was an apartheid state. It was the, you know, the courage of his conviction and morality that helped to open up the space for black participation. If it wasn't Mandela, it would have been a different story. So the institutions are there. They are still there today. But it took one man, Mandela, to change South Africa from an apartheid state to a democratic state. Those are what we talk about. That's why I'm not here talking about my years as a student union leader, which could count for experience because I did better than most state governors when I was a student leader, honestly, in this country. Because at the time in this country, the duty of bringing about democracy, which was what was most important for Nigeria, was on our shoulders when we were in our, in our 20s. But there were military administrators all over the place who were jostling around stealing money. There were civilians who were helping the military suppress our democratic aspirations. But nobody counted as experience. That is experience. I tell people, if I were to be an army in the army, I would have been retired by now as a full-star general, going by the number of wars I fought and the scars that I had to show for 30 years of consistently fighting. But here, who cares? You know, people are looking at those who destroyed the country, and we are rewarding them on a daily basis with social political promotions. We are giving them titles. We called some of them GCON, GCFR, and you look at what they did, they destroyed this country. But for those of us who have fought on the side of rights, what do we get? We get derided. They ask me, where's your experience? Some people will even ask me, why don't you go and run for local governments? You understand? And this country is being run by people who never did half of what I did. In fact, in honesty, and history can bear me witness, even though they don't teach them in schools anymore, when so many of these characters were hiding under their bed in the 90s, we were fighting on the streets for democracy that they are now benefiting from. And I can mention their names one after the other, but there won't be time for it, and that's not what we are here for. Mm, I'm right. here to project to you why I'm going to be your best president ever if you make the right choice next year. Now, Philip, before you come in, let, let me ask, what, when you formed your choice of the uh, AAC as a political platform to run on? Well, you know, what me, does the AAC stand for okay. as of today? I the you know, African Action Congress. And the reason we chose the word Africa is that we are looking beyond Nigeria because the entire African continent is actually looking up to Nigeria. In fact, the black race is looking up to Nigeria to be liberated so that they can find their own meaning and dignity as well. Uh, that's why the word Africa is there. And because Africa, of course, needs action, we must match all of our rhetoric with action for us to make the progress we want to make. Uh, look, I was in South Africa recently, and uh, I was invited on an interview. I spoke for five minutes. They shut down the interview. What was I saying? I said, look, the moment I become the president of Nigeria, the treatment you made out to Nigerians, we stop. They were scared. They don't want somebody to say that. They didn't understand that the president of Nigeria is practically the president of Africa. And I'm not trying to be territorial here, but that moral voice is important on the continent of Africa. You know, and it is true. Look at the only time that Nigeria just pulled its weight on South Africa when they were doing the nonsense with yellow fever cards. The next day, everybody sat right. But you know where we, where we are, where we are today, is because every other person is doing well, and Nigeria is not doing well. We did Ghana must go. Ghana is planning Nigeria must go now. Because Ghana has moved from where they used to be in 1983 to better than where we are. Our celebrities are sending 
airport pictures from Ghana to us as if they went to the moon. Ghana is 34 minutes from here. There's no airport you can send its pictures from here. Because of mismanagement of not just our resources but our space, but they've also mismanaged our mentality to the extent that people have become mental slaves. That is why even young people don't have that pedigree to think that it is possible for a child of nobody to be the president of Nigeria. You only good as far as they are concerned uh, as becoming the local government chairman, not the president, because they don't even think of you as somebody who's capable of doing it because you don't have a name and you're not part of the people who are, of course, sanctified to be president of Nigeria. And that's what must change now. Yeah, I want us to look at things in practical terms. Yes. If you talk to most Nigerians, what they're asking for, they're not asking for too much. Nigerians are not looking for maybe an angel to come from heaven and build heaven here in Nigeria. They're asking for basic necessities of life, yes. basic amenities like water, power, good schools, good roads. Now you want to be president. Yes. How do you intend to provide this for Nigerians if given the opportunity within the tenure of your administration? We have 10 programs that are sitting on three pillars. And the first pillar is security, second is self-sufficiency, uh, and third is sustainability. And the programs are one, security, power, electricity, infrastructure. We want to double the infrastructure in this country, uh, fight against corruption, have an inclusive economic system. I'm not discussing the economics of World Bank structural adjustment program that destroyed this country. I'm talking about an economic system that is built by Nigerians and Nigerians can be proud of. I'm one of the first, I'm the first candidate to propose a 100,000 minimum wage uh, for workers in this country and everybody there was an uproar. Some two weeks ago, South Africa is paying 126,000, uh, equivalent of 126,000 uh, Naira. We want to restructure this country, but we have this agreement with the restructuring that was couched as a political <laughs> party. And the moment the restructuring apostles found their candidate, uh, Atiku, suddenly nobody's talking about restructuring. I've been saying that they didn't mean restructuring. They were forming a party that would turn this country into a paradise for thieves once again. And we're talking about health, education, agriculture, and tourism that is built around technology and modern practices. So you are not asking for more than basic things, right? But you know what I found out, having traveled around this country, having done about 32 states in the last nine months, is actually that we can turn this country into a paradise as well. There's no big deal about it. We can move our electric electricity supply from 3,000 megawatts to 24,000. Using solar energy alone, you can do 4,500 megawatts. Morocco just did it. You can Google it and find out about it. Tunisia is doing it. You know, our gas system, there are nine point something billion cubic feet of gas in Ogoni land alone. That means that we have gas supply enough to provide gas turbine driven electricity that can last us for over 40 years. But you cannot go near Ogoni land today because of the way these same leaders destroy the environment there, kill the people there, and don't want to resolve the problem. They only pay lip service to resolving the problem. We have said we will provide five point something million uh, jobs for young people. And it's not a promise that is based on just promises. We laid it down by saying we want to build 17 million units of housing, just the same way they did in China. For those who like to talk about China, they have what they have, they call ghost apartments. Apartments that have been built that have not been occupied, even though they have over a billion people. That will provide jobs. If we double our infrastructure as it is now, not just managing to do roads, you know, uh, over 13,000 uh, uh, kilometers of road, that will provide over 2 million jobs. If we do what we want to do with agricultural entrepreneurship, which is providing about 1,000 jobs for entrepreneurs in every local government, multiply that by 774 local government. Tell me how many jobs you get. When we hire 200,000 teachers, to find into our system so that we can take over 13 million kids who are out of school now back into school and spend 1.3 trillion naira, 100,000 naira per child to go back to school. Tell me why the country <laughs> will not improve. 
But the leaders in this country are not interested. They are more interested in feeding prisoners 14,000 naira per day than spending 100,000 naira to send children back to school, out of school kids. I want to pay students who are going to university study allowance as well so that they can stay in school and focus on school. And anybody who's going to school and get that study allowance, if you come out and you work with the federal government, maybe as a teacher or in any public position, we forgive the grant. But if you go and find a job in a bank in the private sector, you pay us back with interest. That's how it is done in other places. I'm just giving you this because I know there's not enough time. And this is the reason why I cannot wait to debate so many of these guys, and you heard that we're excluded from the debate because they're afraid of these ideas, these ideas that we ignite growth, the kind of growth and development that we make Nigeria live above the basic necessities of life. We've been talking about basic necessities of life since I was in primary school. We should not be talking about that anymore. People are entitled to live on paradise on earth if their countries can afford it. And our country has shown that it can afford it but we can, afford... can, can our country afford it? Absolutely. No, because the, the, the next uh, <coughs> question will be, how are you going to fund all of these that you talk about? I, In I a would... country where governments, state and federal, are saying they are unable to pay 30000 naira minimum wage. They don't want to pay minimum wage. They are not interested in minimum wage. They are not interested in paying wages, period. These guys are slave drivers. Let me explain why that is the case to you. There's an argument going on between Fayemi in the Kiti State, Kari Fayemi, and his former governor, Fayoshe. And Fayemi found out that Fayoshe had a 10 billion naira given to him through the Paris loan refund. He never paid workers. Why? Because they needed the money to do elections so that he could put his puppet to cover up his behind for him. Fayemi probably would do the same thing. Because the money that was supposed to be used to pay workers in London State was used to help fire me do see and buy in Ekiti. You understand? So why would they pay workers when the money that is supposed to go to workers is more about money they're interested in using to buy voters? These are the kind of leaders you have. They're not interested in paying workers. The no, one in no, Kogi no, State. No, no, you are making from <laughs> very weighty allegations. You are making here. a, a allegations, presidential candidate. Allegations candidate that, you, presidential that candidate. you possibly cannot back up with facts. I will back up with facts. Yeah. Look, I'm in this country. I'm also a reporter. Like every one of you sitting here, whether you don't accept me or not is a different mm -hmm. issue. But I'm a reporter. I run star reporters. I have, I have backed up all these. In fact, so many of the allegations that went to court now that they are trying to court, they first of all appeared on Sahara Reporters. So I'm not lying. I'm not lying that there was Paris reforms that were stolen by governors. There was a governor in Zamfara State, and this is not an allegation, who was given Paris reform and he went and bought homes in America with it. I went and obtained the pictures, I obtained the documents I wish he bought homes with. But because he was friends with the president, he was trying to marry the president's daughter, nobody touched him till today. The governor who was found collecting dollars on tape, is that one allegation too? Why is there nobody touching him? So, these are not allegations. We have facts on the ground. But instead of trying the governor, we are running after the reporter who exposed him and claiming that it's fake tapes. Mr. Shore. Yes. You are an activist, no doubt. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with activism. No, no, no. Right? There's nothing wrong with it. Yes. Some of us are too. Yes. Why do you think people don't take you serious? You think in this race. You think people don't take me seriously? No, no, the perception outside there. The word, where, Does it make it look as... Where, so, here is where I will ask you for the facts. Yes. Where do you get the facts from that there's a perception that people don't take me seriously? I interact with people in the community. But your personal interaction is not enough. It's not empirical enough. It might be that you have a bias for the people you interact with. No, the question I've asked... If I wasn't taken seriously, yes. why do you think they don't want me to be in a debate? Because it's part of the lack of seriousness they think of. Lack of seriousness? And you think Buhari is serious and Atiku is serious? You tell me. No, but beyond that. No, no, we are, are journalists. Yes, beyond your activism. No, no. Beyond your activism. Beyond, your activism. beyond my activism, yes. I just read to you my educational background. I attended the University of Lagos. Good one. Yes. I have a master's degree. Yeah. In Can you allow me to ask the question? Yes, go ahead and ask the question. Beyond your activism. Yes. You come from a very rich cultural background. The mm. Southwest. Who gave you the impression that... I'm a Nigerian, first of okay. all, so I so understand I want you to learn, yes. Yes. You come from a very rich cultural background. Yes. Yeah, we have 
respect and honor and revere elders. Yes. You are considered as somebody that uses some very foul languages on people. Like and what? you want to rule. Like what? I've been here since. What foul language did you detect in my containers? Or so so, so my many. Expression? I cannot continue to. No. I, we, we've been interviewing and I want you yeah. to take me up on that because I want. Because you are. No, but I've listened to you. We, 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 we are, gentlemen, we are very limited. You are a reporter. Let's, let's you, go you, to are, the you are confronting a presidential about, candidate. Yes. And you are on national TV. You can't be flippant with due respect to it's, you. Yes. Another word. No, no. You can't afford to be because. People are watching us. People That's are why I say you see you've used another word. It's, not, it's about the future. No, flippant is not an insulting word. But I mm -hmm. consider it flippant for you to say that people are taking me serious. You know? It's derogatory for you Good. to say that I'm not being taken serious when I've traveled around 32 states in nine months. I have an agenda. I have spoken to crowds around this country. I've been to palaces. I've been to schools. I've been to churches. I have been to town hall meetings, not only in Nigeria, I've been in Canada, I've been in the US, I've been in the UK, I've been in Australia, traveling over 26 hours. And you say people don't take me serious. People are donating to our campaign. You say they don't take me serious, both locally and internationally. Mm. And yes, I'm the only one who has raised money publicly and transparently. And you think people don't take me serious. Mm. That's, okay. why I, that's why I said it was flippant, with okay. due respect. Okay, Mr. Shawari. Uh, uh, many Nigerians are watching, yes. and, and they are beginning to tweet at us. Yes. Now, one of the uh, tweets that I just come in comes from Esco, and who says, uh, who wants you to respond to this question? How do you intend to govern without having corrupt persons in your cabinet? Thank you. So, the assumption that every Nigerian is corrupt is what that government, that, that government will lead you to, that there are a lot of Nigerians who are not corrupt. But the kind of system of governance, you know, of patronage that we've been running over these years have only promoted the interest of the greedy. And we have been serving the greedy to the point that people don't even know that there are Nigerians who are honest within Nigeria and outside Nigeria who can help lead this country to prosperity. A lot of them professionals who are doing so well. And our campaign, as it is, we started nine months ago as a movement has so many of those Nigerians. In fact, we have gotten to a point where we have a shadow cabinet in place. But if you're in doubt about my pedigree and integrity, I did Sahara Reporters for 12 years. I wasn't the only person there. I had reporters, and you can ask anybody who knows some of our underground reporters. It is against our own rules to even accept what they call communiqua, which is the envelopes that they collect when they go and cover events. If I do not have enough money for my reporter, I don't send you to work. You know, and when I started Sarah Reporters a year ago in a lab in Lagos, I promised that anybody working in that lab would not be paid less than the pre minimum wage that I'm proposing today. And that's exactly what I did. But you know what? It didn't take more than two months after I started when they came after me. They seized the money through a law court in, in uh, in 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 Illori, the Senate president seized the money. Of course, I just won the case in the court of appeal, uh, and we're waiting to get that uh, money now. So, and that that leads me to your question about <laughs> cultural respect. You know, if you know the what the elders of this country this country have done to us, you know that they don't deserve respect. In fact, we are nice that we still see them and respect them. They've destroyed what could have been of our dignity. They've brought poverty, they've brought diseases. You know, they've stripped us. That is why when you travel abroad, when other people have been separated and treated by human beings, they ask dogs come and sniff you because you are Nigerian. It's these elders that you ask us to respect that did it to us. Our elders, so many of them, especially the political leaders, don't deserve any respect. I, and I'm saying it without apology. But there are elders in this country who deserve respect, and we respect them, and they respect us. Yeah, you, 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 you talked about the minimum wage yes. that we can pay, but uh, some of these governors don't just want to pay. They don't want to pay. Right. Now, if you are president, how will you get them to pay? One, the governors have immunity. Yes. 
So how will you compare these governors? Because you have listed several allegations about uh, against uh, some of them here. Uh, now, you, if, you, if such a thing happened in your administration, how will you go about it? You know, you know, minimum wage that we are proposing is for federal workers. I am not responsible for state workers as the president of Nigeria. But I will do everything I can. Yeah, what will you do at the state level? So I will do everything I can to help push for payment of wages for workers. You know, there's a difference between minimum wage and a living wage. What I'm proposing is a living wage for workers. So it's to put pressure on these governors and help let everybody know transparently how much they're getting. You know, listen, as we're sitting here today, you can never hear that a governor failed to pay himself the security vote and in any month. It has never happened before. And these security votes are in millions, in some cases billions of naira. Almost 50% of what the minimum wage of workers are in those states. You know, I would walk towards the legislation that will abolish security votes because that's slush funds that are not accounted for. That if they were accounted for, there will be enough money to take care of the minimum wage of workers at 100,000 naira per worker. Let me explain to you how much it will cost us. We've done our calculation. And it's only going to cost $1.5 billion to pay this minimum wage. But it will grow the local economy so fast and so well that it will, our GDP will grow astronomically. Because the people at the top who are earning the highest in terms of allowances and salary, when they get paid, they take the money out. They go to Dubai, London to go and buy houses. When this, the workers, regular workers get paid, they send money to their children, they spend money in schools, they send money to their parents. So minimum wage or living wage is a wage that is retained within the country. But here we are complaining about minimum wage of 30,000 naira. And our senators are taking home 13.7 million naira as allowances every month. Do you know that it takes two years of a PhD holder, a professor that has been working for 14 years, it takes them two years of salary at 40, 450,000 naira per month to make the allowance of a senator? In one month. In one month. Yes. If you are earning minimum wage of 30,000 in Nigeria, it will take you 30 years to make the salary of a senator in a month. The allowance. The allowance of a senator, not the salary. And you have not added the extortion that they carry out in the name of oversight in ministries, departments, and agencies of government. Something that we stop. Look, we should not be deceiving ourselves sitting down. We know all the problems. All the journalists, we know all the problems. Yeah, yes. I want to ask you this yes. question. Mm, but before you okay. ask that question, let me quickly uh, say here, we've been getting a lot of tweets. I, I One of them is from Olumese Ahigbe, yes. who says, we take your worries seriously. Yes, I'm, 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 sure, I'm surprised that our colleague said he, that people don't take me seriously. Uh, but we'll resolve that when we get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but he, no, but, but, but I think they also ask that uh, uh, you, you speak the truth in a raw way. Well, it's, it's what is needed at this time. Uh, we have been raped and destroyed in the rawest manner. And to retrieve and recover from that situation... We have to speak truth to power in the rawest possible uh, way. You have to let, you know, our leaders are tone deaf. And this, that is starting to affect the followership as well. So to break through that ceiling uh, that is preventing people, that's made people very complacent and reticent, you have to go beyond this. That's why we call our campaign revolution now. Mm. Uh, and okay. Victor is also uh, re reacting to the statement you just made about paying a hundred thousand naira as minimum wage to federal workers. Workers, yes. uh, and and his question is: Wouldn't that create anarchy in the system if the workers at the state level yes, are so left unattended? No, there won't be disequilibrium. There won't be disequilibrium. It's you see. What is there is that whatever is happening at the federal, it's, it's the federal government shares money. Every, every revenue that comes to Nigeria is shared between the federal and the state and the local governments, right? And what happens to us is that we need 1.4, 1.3 billion to pay minimum wage of 100,000. 
but we are stealing five billion every year from the public purse. So if we add another billion, we'll be able to pay state workers, or we add, let's say, we add another two billion, which makes it 3.5 billion. We'll be able to pay state workers this amount. But the state workers have to fight for their life that when the money gets to the governors, they pay the monies to them. It's not only salaries that governors are stealing. Governors are stealing local government allocation with impunity in this country. We know that, right? So you cannot continue with... So, you, so it's up to people to also not vote for thieves as their governors. You have to look for a showware in your state as well and vote for him in the next election. Look for a showware as a senator. Let me tell you, the other day I was asking that we should we abolish the Senate and have a unicameral legislative system. There was an uproar in the country. A few days ago, some senators and I think House of Rep members gathered together that they are, they are looking for a parliamentary system of governance. What is a parliamentary system of governance? It's pretty much a unicameral legislative Where system. Where do you think they are coming from? Huh? Where do you think they are coming from? Because the ideas that I have been speaking to is beginning to percolate into the system because people are following me and they are looking at it and saying, this young man has got great ideas. Do you respect uh, senior journalists? I was the one who proposed June 12 as Democracy Day. Today now, I heard the other day that the House of Reps has already passed a law that will make June 12 Democracy Day. And those were the ideas we fought for when we were young. So it's coming from the understanding that the bicameral legislative system is too expensive. The main question I wanted wasteful. to ask you earlier yes. is, you've proposed so many things you want to do. Yes. Minimum wage, yes. infrastructure, education, and so on. Just a few days ago, one of the governors, as a matter of fact, the chairman of the Governors Forum, came out to tell the nation that the president told them that the economy is down. Nigerians should wait and expect more hardship. And now, we are contesting. If you win with a very tattered economy, how do you intend to cope and or actualize all the things you are putting together? With a lot of external borrowing by state and even the federal government. You know, nothing is as bad as deception. You know, this is the same country in which they said through the Federal Inland Revenue Service alone, they said they've made five trillion naira in taxes. Is this correct? That's what they said. Yes. What is Nigeria's budget? Nigeria's budget eight. eight trillion. That means that from FRS alone you've covered a huge percentage of your budget. More than 60%. Exactly. This same year, $320 million was returned from Abacha loot into, that wasn't budgeted for. So, extra money. Right? Even Jump said they made money this year. Trillions. No. <laughs> the Port Authority claimed they made money. EFCC said they recover over 540 something billion naira from people who stole from the past. So who is lying to who? You see, they are telling you. You've that not come to the oil sector. I'm, I'm not going to go there because I'm talking about areas that are not where we naturally get funding from, of course. Revenue from oil sector, I'll go to that later. Because, for instance, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Kachuku, said that Nigeria lost $60 billion to a particular law that was supposed to apply to oil wells that were of a certain depth. They gave them about 10 years of uh, grace not to pay royalties. Now the 10 years has passed. So they are supposed to pay royalties, and from those royalties, we are supposed to get $60 billion. That's just from one law alone. But because nobody is out there in control of the economy, of the country, there's no leadership. With due respect, this country is without government. We only hear from government when things are failing. You don't hear from them when things are going well. But guess what? These same people who are telling you that the economy is going down. When it's time for the election, money will be popping out from everywhere to buy voters. Because the money that's supposed to be used for the development of the country, they are hiding it somewhere for election day. That is 
the crime that leadership is in this country. And that is why Nigerians must open their eyes and ears to those with fresh ideas and get rid of these dinosaurs whose only way of governing is excuses and more excuses and more excuses. And you might say that maybe my language is tough, but this is the time for it, for us to keep speaking the raw truth that can breathe life into a future that we desire in this country because our children need it. Oh, my, my, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let, let me just, because we have very limited time yeah. left, uh, this tweet is coming for Prince MNEK and he's asking, um, he likes your boldness, uh, but what he says, what is your grassroots support base like in the 36 states of Nigeria? And how do you want to win? Because in River State, he says, in River State, they have never seen your party campaigning. Oh, well, that's not correct. In River State, we, we have representatives. In fact, I'm heading to Rivers on Thursday, so you can hear me, meet me there. I just came from Uyo yesterday in Akwaibom State, and reception was massive. The thing is, you have to differentiate between organic followership and you know, the paid pipers, you know, people who are hired because of how the economy has been destroyed to come and say, you know, yes, sir, to the political parties. In some political parties in our underground investigation, when two political parties are coming into town, the same people go to the same rally, you know, because it's a business it's a, uh, uh, that's of people going to rallies. But our own is organic. So we have people in, I've been to River State, I did a town hall meeting there before, and I'm going back on Thursday. I've done 32 states. There's no candidate, both old and new, in this current dispensation, with due respect, that has been to as many states that I have been. I've been to as many places as possible that I went to President Buhari's hometown, Dara, about three weeks ago. I rode into the place. The place, of course, had no light in the night. And told them that they should be expecting their grandfather because we are retiring him next year. And they shared to it. The problem, and I will lay this on, on, on your shoulders and on your feet, is that the media are not covering the new candidates. Every, this is the fourth time in nine months that I'm coming to AIT. Every night you're only covering APC and PDP, the two failed parties that failed this country. You have not conscientiously given new ideas and fresh ideas an opportunity to breed so that more people can see. If you covered us yesterday in New York, and I'm sure you have a correspondence in New York, you would have, it would have been a different story. If you told us you were going we'll to... Tell you. We, yes, we, no, we invite you all the time, but no, nobody shows you, up. You, you didn't tell us about you're going to... Well, you are, or to, or to you, are, you are not the program it's director true. of AIT. No, so I am. That's why I you am, don't know. I am the director of AIT. So you, I should we, know. You have heard about... Never, you have heard about... You have heard about... on Thursday now. You have... No, you have to invite somebody. I'm not saying that we invite you. No, you have... You have to send us formal invitations and notify all and we, we cover all political parties. No. And that is the reason why we have given poli uh, presidential candidates the equal opportunity to feature on this no, I, Look, I appreciate this. This is mm. the this second invitation the before you. The last time I was here, I made the same charge. The truth is that proportionately we are being gamed. We are being the media, the media this will be there. Is the reason why we're skimmed out of the debate. Because I'm sure people who listen to my ideas, my views tonight, we have a different view of who are who is running for the presidency. Sure. Yes. Oh, well, uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Mm. We must go. We have exhausted our one hour on the program today. Yes. Uh, Mr. Shawari, I assure you that if you invite us and invite the media, if you give us notice, adequate notice, we will cover you because we have a policy uh, to cover every political And then you mean so that you get the live coverage, the type that uh, no, PDP no, no, gets? You get the live coverage if you pay for ah, that. Okay. The live coverage I, is you I pay for the Constitution but for news, to get the but for, news <laughs> for news, you will get the same airtime, you will get the same treatment as any other party. I assure you of that. We'll talk about that when we leave the studio. Thank you. Well, we've uh, been hosting uh, Omar Ali Shawari, who is the presidential candidate of the Africa Action Congress. AAC. And I've been joined on the program today by two of my colleagues, Amos Dunia, who is the executive editor for Front Magazine, and Philip Iyam, who is our political correspondent 
with the new Telegraph newspaper. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank so you we, very much. We wish you the very best. Thank you so much. And we look forward to uh, giving your party all the coverage you need. Thank My you. name is Imonia Maluri. Do I reserve a wonderful time for the rest of today. See you again. We'll bring you in another